Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> and pardon my uh, my froggy voice. <laughs> we'll try and keep it moving. Welcome. Welcome to everyone from across the state. Once again, we are meeting virtually uh, to ensure everybody stays safe. And despite the pandemic, masks and travel challenges this year, the Alliance has had a very busy year. And you're going to be hearing later from both Jimmy and myself as we give our <clears throat> president's address. And now let me introduce our co-president, Jimmy Cochran Pratt. Good morning. We're excited to see all of you here and promise a fast paced, exciting meeting. Uh, I cannot tell you how uh, fun it is to watch people sign in. That's, that's wonderful. Stay tuned during the entire meeting for some unique door prizes, as well as our elections of new board members. Before we move forward, I'd like to thank our officers who you'll see, uh, be seeing and hearing from. Um, can we see slide three? And our incredible board members. There are our officers. There are our board members for uh, 2021. And we could not do what we do without the support of our lead organizations. Thanks to all of you. And I know many of you are here today and represented. One last housekeeping note. We hope uh, you had a chance to digest the pre-meeting slides and encourage everyone to stay muted. Please put your um, comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, finally, uh, here's our agenda for the general meeting and the business meeting. And as you can see, we have a lot to accomplish in the next two and a half hours. And now I'd like to introduce Layla Tvet to give our land acknowledgement. All right. Sorry about the delay. Thank you, Jimmy. Good morning, friends from Swain County near the eastern band of the Cherokee's Kuala boundary. We all know that we stand on the shoulders of generations of mothers who have led the way for us. Today, let us acknowledge also that we live in places where indigenous women and their families made their homes thousands of years before most of our ancestors got here. With that in mind, please put both feet on the ground as you are able and as we do, do so, let us pay tribute to Native Americans, their histories and cultures, as President Biden did when he declared October 11th to be a new national holiday, Indigenous Peoples Day. Together, vice and their survival, we stand on their land. May it give us strength to persevere in our fight for equality today and every day. Thank you, Layla. The chair recognizes board member Olinda Watkins for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, everyone. I will say the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you would like to stand, those who can't are able to please stand. Okay. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and with, li and with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, <laughs> Olinda. Thank you. <clears throat> The chair would like to recognize our attending dignitaries. And I'd like to thank all of our legislators and community leaders who made time in their very busy schedules to join us. As much as we would like to hear from each and every one of you, we simply don't have <clears throat> the time. However, we would like to acknowledge your presence. Um, so if Terry Van Dyne, does our vice president of legislation does not call your name, please enter it into the chat. And thanks to all of you for everything you do for North Carolina. Terry. I would like to recognize um, Alderwoman uh, Pat Sledge from the town of Spencer. 
uh, Representative Rachel Hunt, Representative Rosa Gill. Um, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank you. <clears throat> and if we've missed anyone again, please uh, put your name in the chat. All right, welcome everyone again. We're gonna start our president's address. Jimmy Cochran Pratt and I have had the honor of sharing with you our progress or lack thereof. The, uh, the last year and a half have been a challenge for all of us. We started off 2021 on a very high note with the election of a pro ERA president and the hope we'd finally see the Equal Rights Amendment published since all 38 states have ratified. We saw the US House of Representatives once again remove the artificial and arbitrary time limit on the ERA set in the preamble in 1972. And once again, we watched and waited for the Senate to do the same. And we continue to wait and wait. Now in North Carolina, we had a fantastic kickoff with our chief bill sponsors, representatives Julie Von Hafen, Susan Fisher and Carla Cunningham and senators Natalie Murdoch, who you'll hear from later, Natasha Marcus and Valerie Fushi when we filed bills for ratification in the North Carolina House and Senate. <clears throat> we had two programs that day featuring our legislators in a town hall with ERA Coalition President Carol Jenkins and a press conference. But despite all of our hard work, both bills were sent to the respective rules committee without a hearing or even a pretense of a hearing. And 4.2 million women in North Carolina are still waiting for the General Assembly to acknowledge their right, their need for full legal equality under the Constitution. The Alliance participates in bi-monthly calls with the ERA Coalition where we are a lead organization and we collaborate on strategy to see publication of the ERA as the 28th amendment. We published op-eds, we've received news coverage and we've developed a rapid response plan for when the ERA <clears throat> is published as the 28th amendment. And we'll use that to spur some action in the North Carolina General Assembly. And we've partnered with other organizations such as Lillian's List, Zioness, Justice Revival, the United State of Women, US Citizens Abroad, along with our lead organizations with whom we work very closely. And for each monthly board meeting this year, we've invited a lead organization to share their vision and strategy. We've eased into a more far reaching audience when co-president Jimmy, Cochran Pratt participated in a podcast, her two cents, to explain how the ERA will make long-term financial differences in women's lives. Jimmy? The Alliance has presented to our two senators, Burr and Tillis's key staff members in the hopes of enlightening them as to why we need to remove the time limit on the ERA and why the 14th Amendment does not and cannot provide legal protection American women need. We have sponsored and participated in programs with the organizations from across the states. And we have uh, some slides to show you what we've done this year. And we have, um, we have protested in front of the Department of Justice in Washington, DC, demanding publication of the 28th Amendment. We have signed amicus, uh, onto amicus briefs against the National Archivist for publication, written postcards, and letters to our own state senators and representatives, as well as place countless phone calls to them. The Alliance members came out in force on October 2nd to protest against laws that limit, limit women's access to abortion based on the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that hold, upholds the constitutional right of privacy 
of individuals to be protected against excessive governmental outreach and certain personal areas of their lives. And since these types of restrictions only penalize women and not men's roles in pregnancy, it is a clearly a violation of equal rights under the law. We have held enthusiastic and loud uh, rallies August 26 at the North Carolina General Assembly in honor of Women's Equality Day, which we dubbed Women's Inequality Day, to let the NCGA know we are still here, we're mad as hell, and it's time, uh, it's past time to ratify the ERA. Here's some of the slides from that day. We, we had such, such a great time. We had a diverse group of speakers including uh, Von Representative Von Hafen and Fisher, Senator Marcus and Murdoch, former Chief Justice Sherry Beasley, Secretary of Commerce, Michelle Sanders, activist Mandy Carter, along with presidents and directors of our lead organizations who took the podium to address over 100 people on a hot, steamy day outside the North Carolina General Assembly. And yet here we are in the last quarter of 2021, the ERA has neither been ratified in North Carolina nor published in the US Constitution. We are tired and we're frustrated and we know each of you has been steadfast in your support, feel the same way. Nevertheless, we persist. Over the next two hours, we will have a chance to hear from our amazing guest speaker, Allison Tipman with the Alice Paul Institute and our officers who worked tirelessly this year. We uh, will elect a new slate of board members and we'll have some fun with music and door prizes. And finally, share our vision with you for 2022. Uh, we've polished up the crystal ball and we're gonna look into it. We thank you for your consent, continued to support. So let's get this party started. Okay, and it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. Allison Tipman joined the Alice Paul Institute as executive director in January, 2021. Previously, she held the same role at the American Helicopter Museum and Education Center in Westchester, Pennsylvania. She also spent five years as accreditation program officer at the American Alliance of Museums, where she worked with the museums all over the country to improve their operations and achieve accreditation. She has held leadership, curatorial and exhibit management roles at several historic house museums in Washington DC region, as well as the Women's Memorial at Arlington Cemetery. Allison holds an MBA uh, and, and an MA in Museum Studies from George Washington University and a BA in Studies uh, from Bernard College. She's active in the museum community in the Mid-Atlantic region, having served as board member and strategic planning committee chair for PA Museums, president and conference chair of the Small Museums Association, and the president of the Friends of the Greenbelt Museum. Allison lives in South Philadelphia with her family and two gray cats. And if you have questions along the way for Allison, please put them in the chat and we will take those questions at the end of her talk. Allison. Thank you so much. Uh, I just need a moment to be able to share my slides. There we go. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you today. I am so excited. Um, I've been trying to find bright spots during the last year and a half. And for me, one of them is the ability to meet with people all over the country who share the same goals around gender equality and the Equal Rights Amendment. I have to admit, though, I was a little confused and even nervous when I got the invitation to speak today, because I know that those of you here for this talk have been fighting for the ERA longer than I have. I thought, what can I bring to this that this audience won't already know? But I was reassured that I can talk about two of my favorite topics, Alice Paul and the institution that she inspired, the Alice Paul Institute. Most people know Alice Paul, if they know her at all, for her work to embed women's suffrage in the US Constitution. 
Alice was born right here in Mount Laurel, New Jersey in 1885 to William and T.C. Paul, who went on to have three more children. Her home was a working farm of over 100 acres, but her father was actually a bank president. Both of her parents came from prominent local Quaker families. Her maternal grandfather actually founded Swarthmore College, which her mother, Tacey, attended before leaving to get married. Tacey, though, was very active in women's equality. She would take Alice to women's suffrage meetings in the local community. As a child, Alice loved to read and enjoy the activities available to her on the farm. She went to a local Quaker school and then to Swarthmore College. She majored in biology at Swarthmore, not necessarily because she was most interested in the sciences, but because she felt it was the option that she knew the least about, which I think just says a lot about her intellectual curiosity. After Swarthmore, her interests really took her in a different direction. Alice moved to New York to work in a settlement house and study social work. She spent a year there before moving to England to do the same thing. Alice appreciated the need for social work, but came to feel that it was only treating the symptoms of equality rather than the root cause. While in England, Alice was exposed to the women's suffrage movement led by the women of the Pankhurst family. She attended meetings and rallies of their organization, the Women's Social and Political Union, and quickly became enmeshed in its activities. She started to give speeches and participate in protest actions that purposely broke the law in order to draw attention to the cause. Alice was jailed three times in England and Scotland and went on hunger strike during all three confinements. The first time she was released, but the other two times she was force fed. Eventually, as many early 20-somethings do, Alice ran out of money she also needed to take a break to recover her health. So in January, 1910, she sailed home. She enrolled in a doctoral program at the University of Pennsylvania and joined local suffrage efforts, bringing tactics like soapbox speeches and mass open air events that she'd learned in England to an American audience. In 1912, she proposed to the leaders of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA that she be appointed the leader of the effort to fight for a women's suffrage amendment to the constitution. NASA's favored strategy was to persuade individual state legislatures to pass women's voting rights. But Alice was convinced that a federal effort would be more efficient and effective. NASA leaders agreed to let Alice pursue her strategy with the understanding that she would not introduce militant British methods into the American movement and that she would raise her own funds to support her work. This picture shows Alice in the center of the front row with other NASA members. Alice pulled in another American veteran of the British suffrage movement, Lucy Burns, to serve as her right-hand woman. They moved to Washington, DC, and in less than three months had organized one of the largest women's suffrage activities ever seen in the US. On March 3rd, 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, they staged a parade that attracted nearly 8,000 women and their male allies for a march and a staged tableau. The march was a chaotic mess with men violently pushing in from the sidelines to disrupt the marchers, but it made the front pages of newspapers across the country. It also disappointed Woodrow Wilson He'd expected crowds to be waiting to greet his train, but everyone was at the march instead. After the march, momentum had really been generated for the women's suffrage movement, and Alice worked hard to capitalize on it. She fundraised, she recruited volunteers, and she worked to get legislators' attention and support for a federal amendment. Eventually, she became too much for the leaders of NASA. They had always been suspicious of her tactics and motives and eventually decided that she could no longer operate under their organization. Undeterred, Alice and Lucy Burns formed their own organization, the National Women's Party, and kept up their pressure on the politicians in Washington. In 1917, 
the NWP launched the first ever pickets in front of the White House. The women were dubbed the silent sentinels, standing at the front gates of the White House, holding accusatory signs while not uttering a word. Groups came from all over the country to take up sentinel duty in all weathers and conditions. President Wilson initially brushed them off, but eventually became frustrated by their actions, as did passersby. The women's signs would be ripped from their hands and they would be shoved into the street, but they were the ones who were eventually arrested for disrupting traffic. Over 100 members of the NWP went to jail, including Alice Paul. Again, she went on hunger strike and was force fed, as were her compatriots. Finally, in January of 1918, President Wilson announced his support of women's suffrage. The House of Representatives endorsed the amendment the next month. And then after another year of meetings, demonstrations and lobbying by suffragists, the Senate did the same. The 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote became law on August 26, 1920. Alice had spent over seven years at the helm of the fight for women's suffrage. What was she going to do now that it had been achieved? People were surprised to find that Alice viewed the amendment not as the end of the fight, but just the beginning. She wanted full gender equality under the law, and she reorganized the National Women's Party to focus on it. Alice's perspective was grounded in what she had learned writing her PhD dissertation at UPenn entitled The Legal Position of Women in Pennsylvania, which drove home to her just how disadvantaged women were by laws about topics ranging from property to divorce. It motivated her to continue her education in the law, and she obtained her fourth, fifth, and sixth degrees at Washington College, a school founded specifically for women who wish to study the law. Her thesis for her second doctoral degree was entitled The Legal Position of Women in the United States. Even before obtaining that degree, she had become a firm believer that the way to achieve freedom from legal sex discrimination was an equal rights amendment that affirms the equal application of the Constitution to all citizens, regardless of their sex. In 1923, Alice went to Seneca Falls for the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention. She used the occasion to debut her Equal Rights Amendment, then called the Lucretia Mott Amendment. Lucretia Mott had been a tireless abolitionist and suffragist. In addition, she was one of the organizers of the first convention in Seneca Falls, where the Declaration of Sentiments was created with its opening statement, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. The Mott Amendment read, men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. When Alice first introduced it, she stated, if we keep on this way, they will be celebrating the 150th anniversary of the 1848 convention without being much further advanced in equal rights than we are. If we had not concentrated on the federal amendment, we should be working today for suffrage. We shall not be safe until the principle of equal rights is written into the framework of our government. The amendment was introduced in Congress in 1923 by longtime statesman and future vice president, Senator Charles Curtis. In their advocacy for the ERA, the NWP used many of the tactics they'd employed during the fight for suffrage. They took copious notes on all interactions with legislators, including ones like Senator George Moses from New Hampshire, who apparently was dead against the amendment and through putting embroidery in the Constitution. By the 1940s though, both major political parties had added the ERA to their platforms. In 1950 and 1953, it actually passed the Senate, but by then Arizona Senator Carl Hayden had added a sentence. The provisions of this article 
shall not be construed to impair any rights, benefits, or exemptions now or hereafter conferred by law upon persons of the female sex. The idea was that this would allow women to keep their existing and future special protections, rendering the amendment potentially more appealing to groups like labor law reformers who'd worked hard to pass specific protections for women workers. Alice and other supporters of the ERA believed that it negated the amendment's original purpose, so they withdrew their support and it failed to pass in the House. Alice Paul rewrote the ERA in 1943 to reflect the language used in the 15th and 19th Amendments of the Constitution, giving us the version we know and love today. The full amendment has three sections, with section one providing for equality of rights under the law, regardless of sex. Sections two and three are standard additions to amendments. Section two gives the power of enforcement to Congress, and section three gives federal and state legislation a specific time period to make sure that they're in compliance. After 1943, Alice Paul kept advocating for the ERA, but she had also already expanded her work for equality internationally. In 1938, she had founded the World Women's Party and traveled to Switzerland to lobby the League of Nations to include an equal rights clause in its charter. As World War II approached, she provided a safe haven for several Jewish activists and intellectuals until they could secure safe passage out of Europe. Following the war, Alice was instrumental in including gender equality in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. She also campaigned to include gender equality in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. In 1972, Congress passed the ERA and Alice Paul officially retired from the National Women's Party. She moved to Connecticut and outlived all of her family except one nephew. When her health worsened, she came to live in a Quaker nursing home just a mile from her childhood home in New Jersey. There, though in failing health, Alice received guests and tracked the progress of the ERA as it moved through ratification by the states. She made all of her guests promise to contact their legislators about the ERA. Alice Paul died on July 9, 1977, at the age of 92, without seeing her dream of the ratification of the ERA come to fruition. However, advocates for the ERA kept fighting. The time limit to ratify it passed without the necessary 38 states doing so leaving the ERA to lay fallow from 1982 until the fight picked up again in the 1990s. Eventually, three more states ratified it, and now we're focused on getting the Senate to pass a bill already passed by the House that would remove the time limit for ratification and make the ERA officially the 28th Amendment. I know you have heard and are going to hear more about that effort. So now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what Alice Paul's tireless work for gender equality and the ERA have inspired. In 1984, a group of members of the NOW chapter near Alice Paul's birthplace decided that something should be done to commemorate the 1985 centennial of her birth. They founded the Alice Paul Centennial Foundation and quickly set about raising awareness of Paul's work and inspiring others with her story. In 1987, they purchased the only known collection of books, papers, and artifacts that had belonged to Alice. They offered items at institutions like the National Museum of American History and kept the remainder. Later in the 1980s, a really exciting opportunity arose. The owners of Alice Paul's birthplace, the Firehearns, shown here, wanted to sell the house, and they approached the Alice Paul Centennial Foundation to ask if they would be interested in purchasing it. One of the founders of, of APCF is pictured here, Barbara Irvine, at the press conference announcing that the foundation would in fact be making the purchase. After that press conference, Barbara and our other founders then went out 
and did the fundraising necessary to actually make the purchase possible. They were successful. And this is the headquarters of the Alice Paul Institute to which our organization has evolved. The house was built in 1800 and renovated in 1880 before its 1883 purchase by Alice Paul's parents. It remained in the Paul family until 1958. The Alice Paul Centennial Foundation purchased the building and six and a half acres. They quickly worked to have it designated a National Historic Landmark. Sidebar, their first application was denied. They were told that the fact that the Sewell Belmont House was already a landmark was enough recognition of Alice Paul. Fortunately, they reapplied and uh, the organization rethought its decision. The house was restored in 2001 to the way it appeared when Alice Paul lived here. Today, the mission of our organization is to honor the legacy of Alice Paul's work for gender equality through education and leadership development. And our vision is gender equality for all. The house has never been a traditional historic house museum. There is very little furniture because what's important for us is that it's a flexible space. We can give people tours that focus on the women's suffrage movement and Alice Paul's contribution to the movement for gender equality. But we can also welcome a class of second graders to make their own women's suffrage signs and march around the house in a faux protest. Our uh, leadership very early on decided that the best way to honor Alice Paul was to create the next generations of female leaders who would take on her work for gender equality. We have a slate of leadership development programs of which I'll talk more in a moment as well as an archive and library and an exhibit that talks about Alice Paul's work. These are the members of our Girls Leadership Council on a visit to Washington, DC to learn about and participate in advocacy work. GLC meets once a month during the school year to discuss issues affecting women and girls in the US and around the world. They practice their leadership skills through participation in an executive board and committees. They design projects to benefit other girls and women. They network with professional women, finding role models and mentors to help lead them forward. And they learn to use their voices to advocate for gender equality and other causes that matter to them. Other programs for girls that focus on leadership include our Alice Paul Professional Leadership Institute, which involves high school girls in thinking and planning for college and career opportunities, similarly providing them with women role models and having them think about what their rich future will look like. We also do a program for middle schoolers called Lead Away that empowers them by teaching them to utilize and better understand their own leadership skills and to use those unique leadership traits to affect positive change in their communities. Beyond our slate of programs for girls, we are also active in our community and with other efforts to educate youth. We give tours of Paul Sale. Previously, those were all in person. Now they're in person as well as virtual. We present one to two community programs a month on topics related to suffrage, civic engagement, gender equality, and the ERA, and also do programming on demand for local community groups. For youth, we have field trip programs and in-school programs that serve all grades on Alice Paul, the suffrage movement, and leadership. Our community programs are listed on our website and are all currently on Zoom, so I hope you'll think about joining us. You can learn more about the Institute's work at alicepaul.org. And I know several of you are already familiar with our other website, equalrightsamendment.org. But if you have not visited, I encourage you to do so, if only for the fun downloads that you can use as new Zoom backgrounds. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Allison. And now we will go forward with, with questions. I will say that a, a pretty large group of us were planning to come visit you and go on to Seneca Falls uh, in March of 2020. 
and very disappointingly we had to to cancel that but uh, but thank you uh and uh and we have some questions in the chat that you can offer us we do jimmy we have several um the first question is do we know what made president wilson change his mind in supporting the movement so there are some great books out there about Alice Paul and Woodrow Wilson. They're listed on our website. I encourage you to do a little reading. Um, I think working in this position at API has turned Woodrow Wilson into my least favorite president. I already knew that he was thought to be racist and narrow-minded. Um, he also really applied that narrow-mindedness to women's suffrage. He was not personally in favor. He didn't see the point. Uh, I think what changed his mind was, as I noted, annoyance at the suffragists, as well as what had happened during World War I. It was really too much for me to go into, but the participation of women in the war effort combined with the suffrage movement really made it impossible for Wilson and our other legislators to ignore women's contributions to our society. Those two things just really brought women out into the public sphere, um, especially sort of mainstream middle-class women were the ones who had the power to advocate for the right to vote. It was, and the war also made it palatable for Wilson to come out in public and support suffrage in a way he hadn't done before. Great, thank you. Are there plans for an Alice Paul statue in New Jersey? There are so few statues of women sheroes in the US. Um, we don't specifically have plans for an Alice Paul statue in New Jersey, but there are statues of Alice either existing or planned. There's a relatively new um, women's suffrage monument in Virginia near the Occoquan Workhouse where Alice Paul and the other NWP members were imprisoned. Um, and Alice is heavily featured there. There's also an effort to replace one of the statues that New Jersey has in the US Capitol with a statue of Alice Paul. As much as we'd like to uh, have her even more acknowledged in New Jersey, She's actually pretty no well known around here. Um, so I love the idea of her getting more attention in DC. Great. Is Alice Paul's dissertation on the legal position of women in the US available to read online anywhere? Oh, this is a great question. And what I'm always excited to answer, um, Alice Paul's dissertation is available to read online. The University of Pennsylvania has one copy that is digitized. There's an effort underway spearheaded by a professor at UPenn and her students to fully transcribe it to make it more readable. She has actually gotten some attention for that project, including an appearance on NPR and a program that she did with us because UPenn should have two final bound copies of Alice Paul's dissertation and they don't. That was the requirement for everyone's dissertation and Alice Paul's copies either don't exist or are missing. The one copy they have seems to be a draft um, because it's a mix of a couple different handwritings as well as some typed portions. Uh, and no one knows if a final copy exists and if it does where it is. Um, so as you're going around to use bookstores, if you know any rare booksellers, please keep an eye out for Alice Paul's dissertation. We would all love a final copy. Great, thank you. Are the leadership programs for girls available to young women outside of New Jersey? They are now. With the pandemic, we pivoted all of our programming to virtual and are now working to make everything available in both virtual and in-person options. Our Girls Leadership Council is actually offered in a hybrid fashion where there are girls here at the Alice Paul Institute at the same time as there are girls in DC, California, and other locations attending via Zoom. And the two groups are allowed to, or permitted, able to talk to each other thanks to um, some really great technology we were able to get because of a grant uh, that saw the importance of bringing girls together to take part in these leadership development opportunities. Great. Do we have a strong advocate for the ERA in the Senate that can influence the course of the amendment? Have you reached out to Kamala Harris or Jill Biden to help? So the Alice Paul Institute participates in the work of the ERA coalition. And I know you're gonna hear more about the coalition's work later in the program. So I'm actually gonna let them handle this question because I know that they are hard at work finding advocates in the Senate for the effort. Great. 
So this last one is, is a comment. The Alice Paul Institute was kind enough to grant me, this is from Audrey Muck, permission to use several photos from the archives for her documentary series, Brazen Bells. And she expresses her thanks to the Institute for sharing those photos. So I think that's you, all we've got. <laughs> you're very welcome, Audrey. Thank you. And I have one more question, Allison. Could we actually credit Alice Paul with some of the modern demonstration techniques that we now use in the United States? Totally. And I don't think she gets enough credit for her innovations in protest and advocacy work. I tried to highlight a few of her efforts, the way she got inspired by the British suffrage movement, brought some of their tactics, but also used her own. Um, like I said, the NWP was the first group to protest outside the White House. I grew up outside of DC. I, I was very used to every time I went by to seeing multiple groups protesting. So it's mind boggling to me that no one had really thought to do that before. But I think um, that Alice Paul's work, the work of the NWP, really changed the way people thought about the president and their legislators, so that they weren't these figures um, that should be shut away behind gates and not listening to their constituents. And that if they weren't listening, you had to use tactics that would get in their face that would make them listen. I think we have one more question. In the chat, Anne. Sorry about that. That one just popped up. Um, actually, there's two more. Does the NWP still exist? Great. A very timely question. Last year, the NWP dissolved as a separate organization. So they uh, deeded their former headquarters, the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument, to the National Park Service so that it could continue to be preserved and interpreted for the public. And they gave the NWP archives to the Library of Congress, which actually already held some collections related to NWP history. LOC is currently involved, heavily involved in cataloging and digitizing those collections. We at the Alice Ball Institute took the trademark and some responsibility for the legacy of the NWP. Um, we committed to using that legacy as um, a reminder of the importance of talking about the women's suffrage movement and then NWP's work for gender equality. So we try to do programming related to that act, advocate and activist legacy. Thank you. We only have time for one more question. We've got two up here, but I'll, I'll go with the, the next one that came in. And are you associated with the Women's History Project? We are associated with a lot of different organizations and efforts. I'm not sure about the Women's History Project project specifically, but if someone wants to reach out and send me more information, please do. I do want to note the last question is about Polly Murray. Um, our community, one of our community programs in November is actually about Polly Murray and will be presented by Rosalind Rosenberg, who wrote a biography of Polly. Uh, so I really encourage you to attend that virtual program if that's, uh, if that's one of your interests. Great. Thank you. Jimmy? Thank you. Okay, so thank you, uh, Allison. That was an incredible overview of, of Alice Paul and the Institute. I have family in New Jersey and that is one of my goals is to get up there and go and visit the uh, Alice Paul Institute. So the chair recognizes Vice President Public Relations, Terry Wally for the announcement of our first door prize, Terry. Hi, y'all. Um, thank you, Allison, for that. We were actually influenced ourselves by Alice Paul. We've cre recreated her banners that you can see right behind me um, to apply to North Carolina. Um, we are giving out some great door prizes today, and we've based them on some significant numbers for, for the ERA. Um, the first one goes to the 38th person who entered the meeting, and 38, of course, stands for the 38 states that were necessary to ratify the ERA, which obviously we have met. And the door prize is We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment by Julie Suck. And um, it's a fantastic book, and it goes to um, State Representative Rosa Gill. Thank you. 
Terry. And if a state representative, Rosa Gill, would put her address in the chat to uh, Terry Wally, that would be great. Yep. And I will we'll get it in the mail to you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. The chair recognizes co-president Jimmy Cochran Pratt for our next introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the champions of the ERA in North Carolina, Senator Natalie Murdoch. Uh, you can see that she attended our Women's Inequality Day and was a full participant and a speaker. Uh, she has served one term in the uh, General Assembly and has already seen legislation she sponsored passed. That is rare. Uh, she's a champion for women, families, and the environment. And once again, if you have questions for the Senator, please put them in the chat. Senator Murdoch. All right, good morning. So happy to be here with all of you. And um, I will be let's see, getting ready to share my screen here. I'm gonna provide you all with some legislative updates. Here we go. All right. All right, so can you all see my screen now? Great. Yes, Natalie, we okay. can see. Just confirming. <laughs> <laughs> Just confirming. Technology is not always our friends. Um, so again, Senator Natalie Murdoch, I'm honored to be here um, with, with all of you um, this morning. Um, have to give um, special um, shout outs just to the chairs, thanking them for all the phenomenal work. Um, Lori's actually in my district, proud to be her senator, um, as well as Jimmy, who is also a phenomenal photographer. That is how you got these great um, shots from our um, uh, inequality day that we recently had at the General Assembly. Also, my colleagues in the General Assembly um, have seen um, Re uh, Representative Rachel Hunt, um, as well as Representative Rosa Gill, if there are others. Um, sorry for uh, missing you here. Um, and also um, Terry Van Dyne, who I had the pleasure of serving with um, in the Senate uh, before she moved on to do this amazing work. So happy to be here um, with all of you this morning. So I'm going to touch on um, some legislative um, updates for you, um, some bills that um, we've been championing that go along with the um, topic of just fighting for inequality for women um, and kind of what does that look like? It looks very different um, today where we're not only fighting for basic rights, but also um, seeing that discrimination um, looks very different today um, than it did some years ago. So um, there are a lot of different ways that we are striving to um, form a more equal and perfect union by making sure women have um, the, um, the access that they need and protections that they need. Um, so first is one that um, we actually do have a little bit of traction on. And um, before I get into this specific act, because um, I do not want to forget to acknowledge them, the bill that is not on here that I'm also a primary sponsor of, along with other ERA champions, um, Representative Julie Von Hafen, as well as Senator Natasha Marcus, I'm on a bill um, with them to... Um, repeal the sales tax for menstrual products. And so when we um, receive that fiscal note, um, some five to $8 million a year um, come to the state through taxes for menstrual products that are only being paid by people who menstruate. If that, if that is not a sign of inequality, I don't know what else is. And so, uh, you know, our colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle love to repeal taxes. And so we came into session saying, hey, you know, this is something that uh, we think that we can agree on um, that we need to repeal this sales tax because it is not fair um, that, you know, the millions of dollars um, in tax revenue are, are simply being paid um, predominantly by women. And so um, we were getting a little bit of traction around that in the House. Representative Von Haven was working on that at the end of last session, ended up filing it this session. Um, at the time, she was working with one of the finance chairs on that. So we'll keep pushing forward. Um, and this is a national movement. Some states have already repealed the tax. Um, even Georgia got really close, which is a great segue to um, Senate Bill 698, the End Menstrual Poverty Act. Um, so initially, the sales tax repeal would have been a part of this act, but because of the work that my colleagues were doing before I came into the Senate, um, the End Menstrual Poverty Act really focuses on um, 
uh, marginalized individuals, homeless, low income, as well as our students in K through 12 schools. Um, so it's an act to provide feminine hygiene products to students in schools and increase access to um, menstrual products in our North Carolina diaper banks. It would allocate $250,000 in funds through grants as the previous grant administrator. Um, I wanted this to be a demonstration project where um, the goal is to really look at school districts that we think have the most need. The best proxy we have for that are schools that um, have a lot of students on free and reduced lunch. Um, so the concept is to kind of open up the grant to those schools first um, for this statewide fund of $250,000. Your school district can apply to the Department of Public Instruction um, for a grant so that that local school district can purchase those products and provide them to our schools for free. Um, then $350,000 would be provided to the Diaper Bank of North Carolina. Um, they're a nonprofit that um, provides um, products even to our homeless shelters and domestic violence centers. So um, that was a concept provide, um, behind um, providing um, funding to the Diaper Bank of North Carolina. Um, the exciting piece about this is we actually do have some movement on that. Um, that $250,000 actually is in the Senate budget. Um, so we do anticipate this very possibly could be included um, in our state budget, which would be a huge, huge win. Um, that's why I wanted to highlight that one first since we actually did um, get some movement. That's a little secret we have in the General Assembly. If your bill does not move forward, um, fight to get that provision in the budget. Even some policy provisions can also make it in the budget. There we go, I'm sorry. Yeah, a little frozen moment there. Um, the North Carolina Crown Act um, on my social media just highlighted the uh, kind of the, the phenomenal women behind the Crown Act at the national level um, are actually being featured on Essence Magazine this month, excuse me, Ebony Magazine this month. So had to, had to highlight um, the Crown Act that is Senate Bill 165 again, along with other phenomenal ERA champions um, in the house. We have um, Representative Carla Cunningham as a part, excuse me, sorry, I got my bills confused. Um, in the um, house, we have Representative um, Candy Smith, as well as Representative um, Vernetta Austin, um, Carolyn Logan, and I believe Representative a Amber Baker is the other sponsor in the House and the Senate. Um, it is myself, as well as Senator Valerie Fushi um, and Senator DeAndre Salvador. We all work together on the Crown Act. And this one is another one that we're, we're really, really um, proud of. Um, I believe in legislating from 360 degrees. And so we were able to get traction um, on the Crown Act across the entire state um, through, through being pretty creative. But um, what is the Crown Act? The Crown Act basically is saying you should not discriminate against someone simply because of their hair. Um, two stories that are highlight. One was in my own district. Um, a, a young Black female student was playing softball. I believe she's only a sophomore um, in high school. In my own district, cringed when I learned that she had to cut her hair during a softball game um, simply to move forward with that softball game because of her braids and her beads. Um, the um, umpire or, or referee said that she was um, not in compliance with their, um, their rules, even though she was halfway through the game. And um, it was uh, one of the championship games, so she did not want to let her teammates down. And so um, they literally took scissors during this game and her hair was cut. So that is a local example of why we need to pass this legislation. She and her father did not let this go, even made it on Good Morning America, CNN. It became a national news story. Also, I want to thank the Southern Coalition for Justice that has really continued to work with them and beat the drum on this. Um, we have another phenomenal high school student. She is the niece of um, State Representative um, Brandon Lofton in the House, and she's formed an entire coalition in Charlotte, um, I believe Queens for Change around this movement. Um, and so at the state level, we, are, we were able to work directly with Governor Roy Cooper to do two things. He signed an executive order um, prior to July 3rd so that all of the departments that he manages as governor, they will change their HR policies to say that you cannot discriminate against someone simply because of their braids, their locks, their twists, however they wear their natural hair, um, they should not be denied employment or, or promotion um, simply because of their hair. Uh, we, we filed the bill in the House and the Senate on what is the most exciting as well, um, the last bullet here across the state of North Carolina, the non-discrimination ordinances most recently, uh, Wake County moved forward with theirs. There is um, language in there that addresses the Crown Act. And so we have to thank Kendra um, and Equality NC for working with us in concert. So 
all the non-discrimination ordinances you're seeing across the state um, more than likely do include some language around the Crown Act. Um, Durham, um, City of Durham and Durham County, I believe, were the, were the first. Um, and from there, um, we continue to do that across the state. And then um, a huge culmination on July 3rd um, was announced as um, Crown Day. Um, in the state of North Carolina through Governor Cooper. Um, and again, that student in Durham was a huge part of that. The governor simply could not believe that um, this young, young woman um, had to cut her hair during a softball game. And um, to highlight what this means to people, I'm a millennial, I'll speak in social media terms. Um, I have right around 2000 followers on Instagram. And when I just posted the graphic of our governor signing this proclamation, um, 8,000 people engaged with that graphic. So that is just, and this was nationwide from Texas to New York, folks just could not believe that a Southern governor would sign that proclamation um, as a, a governor in the South. Um, and so I'll end with talking about Senate Bill 622, the Momnibus Act that we were just humbled by the attention this bill has received. Uh, we are only the second in the nation behind California to have a state level um, momnibus um, following the leadership of North Carolina's own Representative Alma Adams, who, um, as you know, is also ERA champion, but served um, North Carolina faithfully for years in the House. And um, she worked with Congresswoman Lauren Underwood at the congressional level um, on an omnibus act to protect mothers and to address um, maternal health and Black maternal health. Here in North Carolina, um, the March of Doms has given us a D. Plus. We rank um, 37, 38 when it comes to preterm births, and we are missing our mark. We are actually doing worse with maternal health than we were 20 years ago. So we are missing um, something here. And so we wanted a really um, impactful piece of legislation to address this. Um, so it will work to improve maternal health outcomes here in North Carolina. Um, Black women are two to three times more likely to die at childbirth um, compared to white women. And, and that even includes women that have similar economic backgrounds, similar education, similar health. Um, so we know that we um, are really, really missing something when it comes to maternal health. So this bill would establish a task force to address social determinants of maternal health, um, as well as more maternal mortality prevention um, grant programs um, in concert with DHHS. It would also seek to address implicit bias in healthcare by establishing the training program um, for healthcare professionals um, to really get a handle on what is it that we're missing? What, what are we doing wrong? Um, and also we have a huge military presence here in North Carolina. Um, the federal version of this bill um, or one aspect of the bill is moving forward. We do have something for moms that are veterans or those that previously served. And um, that is something that we actually are getting traction on the other side of the aisle. So next session, um, Momnibus 2.0, you definitely will see um, specific provisions for um, moms and, and, and women in the, in the military. Um, and for social determinants of health, we do have a provision with Medicaid transformation um, called Healthy Opportunities um, that will address some of those social determinants of health, such as um, your, your mental health, your transportation, your ability to have um, access to healthy food. So um, there are so many factors that go into the ability for someone to have a healthy pregnancy. So um, due to the success of Momnibus this year, um, we will be filing Momnibus 2.0 next year. We will deal with issues such as myself, I'm a single woman. And what if you want to, um, you know, go it alone and have children? Um, you know, those fertility programs are pretty expensive to have access to with someone that's single. So much, much more to come. Um, and continuing to work with healthcare systems across this entire state um, on that, getting a lot of traction. Um, also have to highlight again, other ERA champions such as um, Representative Erla Insko and um, Representative Carla Cunningham. They also filed a bill in the house um, to provide Medicaid to women um, 12 months postpartum in the house. That initially was gonna be a part of the momnibus, but in working with Senator Sidney Batch, who were having very serious conversations with Republicans in the Senate around um, Medicaid for women 12 months postpartum. They are currently, those women are taken off of Medicaid after 60 days, which is ridiculous and inhumane. Um, so we took that out of the momnibus and uh, worked with our Republican colleagues to get that in the Senate budget. And um, luckily for us, um, that was included in the Senate budget. We do anticipate that will be in the state budget, not full on Medicaid expansion, but a huge, huge one for moms. Um, and finally, I am also um, a new member of the National Organization of Black Elected Women, Nobel. 
Um, I would say in Noble, it is Novell. Um, to be clear, um, we recently had our national conference in Memphis, Tennessee, um, just a few weeks ago, and um, did pass a Equal Rights Amendment resolution um, at that um, national convention. So wanted to end by sharing um, that we are continuing to work at the national level um, so that we can um, do a better job in making sure um, that all legislative uh, members that are women nationwide are continuing to beat the drum um, for Equal Rights Amendment uh, uh, legislation at the state level. So um, thank you all again. If you have any questions, um, I will be here um, for, uh, for a little bit if you want to just shoot me a chat directly. Um, and thank you all again for the support and all of the work that you engage in every single day. Thank you so much, Senator Murdoch. That was great. And uh, congratulations on all the work that you're doing to represent all of us. And again, I'm very proud that you're my senator you do. as well. Uh, I know we have a few questions. I saw those pop up in the chat. Uh, Anne? Sure. Senator Murdoch, what can we do to urge the legislature to vote on the ERA bills? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think continuing to go to your members individually and like a lot, a lot of pieces of legislation as Senator um, Terry Van Don knows, I think the strategy that we need to utilize with these statewide organizations are um, to be partisan for two seconds. If you have a Republican that represents you in the House or the Senate and you are their constituent, you need to go to them. We really, for, for so many different um, uh um, issues that we want to get traction on in the General Assembly. Uh, we need a 100 county strategy and, um, you know, let them know you represent me in the General Assembly. You know, I want you to take the ERA seriously and also utilizing all the tools that the ERA um, um, Alliance here in North Carolina has for you, dispelling those myths such as, you know, women will be drafted to go to the army and, and all the, literally the same talking points that we have been hearing since the 1970s are what you will hear um, from my colleagues as to why um, they are opposed. So go directly to them, dispel those myths um, and really, you know, implore them to take action and to move forward. Great, thank you. Have you thought of insisting that feminine hygiene products and diapers be allowed to be purchased with food stamps? We have, um, and that is actually something um, one of my, my colleagues in the Senate, um, not only that, worked to get the taxes removed for diapers as well um, in the Senate some years ago. So um, everything is, is, is on the table. Um, this approach was um, the result of conversations that I had very, very early on in session. Um, and I think folks forget on both, let me, I think in both chambers, but specifically in the Senate, uh, we have a lot of women in leadership. And so I went directly to um, Senator Kathy Harrington out of Gaston County um, about this issue early on in the session, along with um, Senator Sawyer. And um, it was Senator Ballard that actually was able to put this in um, as a line item for DPI. So it was really strategy is how we ended up with this approach. Since I got a lot of traction from Senator Ballard, she is chair of the education committee. So she put it in the budget. Um, she, she, with a stroke of a pen, uh, was able to put it in, in the Senate budget and, and said that she would work really hard to make sure it ended up in the final budget. So um, the approach that you see in the current budget um, is a result of um, the, the path of least resistance that we identified as a result of conversations that we had. And even with um, our finance chair went to um, Senator Newton as well as um, Senator Jackson. So um, even, even went to some of my male Republican colleagues around this. And um, the, I think the other note around this topic is it has been um, shockingly easy to, to talk about. Uh, we, I have Republican colleagues who share with me their daughters in, in middle school and high school um, have drives at their own school where they take their lunch money and allowance to purchase these hygiene products um, to give them to friends. Um, so a lot of them had a reference point that I didn't even, even expect. Um, so it is something that we will continue to, to push forward on. I think if we're able to get it in the budget this year, um, according to the Department of Public Instruction, if we can get it up to half a million dollars, we could almost cover all of the schools um, in North Carolina, which was shocking to me. Um, another reason we got success with this approach, we followed Georgia. Um, so when I go to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I always provide them with examples in the South. I don't say 
California is doing this, New York is it, that has nothing to do with North Carolina. I'm just going to be honest with you. But when I say, wait a minute, Georgia put a million dollars in the budget with a Republican governor for menstrual hygiene products, that is how I got their attention. They said, Georgia did this? Yes. Um, but to be clear, Georgia did do it with the state coalition, which I think it may not be a direct fit for the um, ERA Alliance here in North Carolina, um, but I do think it, it is something to consider. Um, that is how they got success in Georgia. It's a coalition of about 30, 40 groups. Um, so that is how they were able to not only get that million dollar line item in Georgia, um, but also came really, really close to getting the sales tax removed. Very close. The million dollars was a um, negotiation tactic. Since they couldn't get the sales tax repeal, they said, we'll put a million dollars in the budget, you know, so that you women will go home and, and leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple more questions. We'll try to get through these. Um, does the Crown Act apply to males too? Yes, it does. Thank you for that. Um, one of the reasons, and I skipped over, it actually passed at the U.S. House level. One of the sponsors was Cedric Richmond, who was now, he was then represented out, out of Louisiana, is now one of the special assistants to um, President Biden. And he was one of the primary sponsors in the House. And um, an issue with the male got his attention. There was a black male with locks who had to cut his locks in the middle of a wrestling match. So we continue to see instances in sports. Um, but from a strategic standpoint, it's helpful to us as legislators because that gets the attention of men. That's how I got the attention of my Republican colleagues in the Senate. I'm not going to get on that today, but I'm sure you all have seen they're doing a lot of work around um, our high school athletic association, which I don't agree with. But since I know they care about sports, I said, well, this is what's occurring. Um, so it's a way to educate our legislative members that don't have a reference point to say, that story you saw in the news, that is why we need the Crown Act. So yes, the same goes for men, um, especially Black young men facing so much discrimination um, simply from wearing twists or locks or, or afros or however they wear their hair. Um, and also to be clear, they would still have to, to comply with you know, basic safety standards in the workplace. It has nothing to do with that. We are dealing with issues of discrimination. We found what we know for a fact, they were literally discriminated against just because of their hair. Um, and it really has become another tool of racial discrimination. Great. Okay, I've got one last question. There are several comments in the chat, so I urge folks to take a look at that when they get a chance. Many of them thanking you and urging you to keep up the good fight. Um, but, but the one other question is, what will it take for the North Carolina General Assembly to bring the ERA to the floor? I know you, you've talked mm -hmm. about what we can do, but what, what is it going to take to get that to the floor for a vote? Yeah, I think two things. Um, I think the first is, again, reaching out to um, your, our colleagues that are on the other side of the aisle, by and large. And I'll have to go back. I think virtually every member of the Senate um, Democratic Caucus, there are 22 of us, I think virtually every single one of them signed on to co-sponsor that bill. So it really, really is um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that unfortunately at the national level have turned the ERA into something that it is not, again, as a result of politics that go all the way back to um, particularly the 80s, you know, when we kind of kind of saw that shift in how the ERA was was perceived when we were unable to um, get ratification through those those final states. And um, uh, I'll, I'll close with uh, it will take um, changes at the ballot. It, it will take changes in the composition of the House and the Senate, but also more than anything, what I shared at the Inequality Day at the General Assembly, we will continue to file it because it is the right thing to do. Um, I file a lot of bills that I don't know if they're going to move, but I file it because it's the right thing to do. In every single session, we are committed to saying we will continue to file a resolution for the ERA because it is the right thing to do. Uh, we have millions of women, you know, 4.2 in the graphic that are not provided with equal access and opportunity. So we will continue to go to our colleagues and implore them to do the right thing. If they fail to do the right thing, we will continue to file it. We will continue to amplify. We will continue to support all of the national work that is going on and state level work going on around the ERA. Thank you so much, Senator Murdoch. This was great. I know there's so many more questions and again, <laughs> If you want to direct them to her in the chat, I, we will uh, do our very, very best to, um, to answer those, I'm sure. So I am so pleased to introduce our next speaker, Jennifer Tucker. She is the Senior Policy Analyst Consultant at the ERA Coalition and has three decades of experience in bringing the intersectional and diverse voices of women and girls into the policy arena. 
Ms. Tucker is an independent consultant and provides senior level strategic support, program development, and policy expertise to organizational executives related to promoting gender, racial, social, and economic justice. Her clients include the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, Black Women's Roundtable, and the Alliance for Excellence Education. Uh, she served as Vice President at the Center for Women Policy Studies, where she was instrumental in developing a network of women state legislators, the Foreign Policy Institute for State Legislators, and the internationally acclaimed Global Power which is a partnership of women elected appointed representatives program. She holds an MA in urban studies from the University of Maryland and a BA in sociology from the American University. And again, any questions for our speaker, please put them in the chat. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you. It is so wonderful to have this invitation and to be a part of this morning's meeting. It's always a pleasure to work with your co-chairs, Lori and Jimmy, but today I have the pleasure and the honor of spending time with all of you, the wind beneath their wings. Jimmy and Lori asked me to bring an update, provide an update about what's going on in Washington with regards to the ERA. Washington is an interesting place and that it can be a little intense at times. A long time ago, I learned how intense when I heard warrior woman Maxine Waters say, in politics, there are no permanent friends or permanent en enemies, just permanent interests. And that defined Washington until now. As I'm sure you've noticed, Washington is consumed by the, by the infrastructure negotiations. Intertwined with this is filibuster reform, voting rights reform, abortion reform, and the ERA. This week, the ERA had a rare special moment when the House Oversight and Reform Committee held a hearing entitled The Equal Rights Amendment Achieving Constitutional Equality for All. Before the hearing, we um, hosted a successful press conference attended by none other than Speaker Pelosi, our chief sponsor in the Senate, Ben, Senator Ben Cardin, Chairwoman of the committee, Carolyn Maloney, and the leadership of the House Democratic Women's Caucus, along with a host of other women members of Congress. At the hearing, you, we heard from our very own Carol Jenkins, who is the CEO and president of the ERA coalition, along with two of our board members, Bambi Sacito and Alyssa Milano, who were both witnesses along with Carol. To be honest with you, we thought abortion would be the issue that the opposition would focus on, but it was not. But we expected awful questions and prepared for awful questions like, Will the ERA force government to pay for abortions? Do you believe abortion should be permitted at 39 months, I'm sorry, at 39 weeks and when a woman is in labor? What about the fact that children in the womb can experience pain? And uh, what, no, are there any limitations on abortion that you would agree with? We were all ready for these questions, but they never came. And boy, were we relieved that they never came. But what we did hear um, was um, about, came, but 
we did hear them start to ask about the ratification process. One member from Louisiana said, I support the ERA, but not this way. And uh, we can't do it this way. Another intense moment came when a witness, and that was Elisa Milano, was asked to give three good reasons, good things that she thought about the country, about the country. And this happened because the member who was questioning her wasn't happy with her testimony. So he went on the defensive. We heard a lot about inflation, but we didn't get the bruising that we thought we would get. I can't help but think these questioners knew something that we don't acknowledge as much as we should maybe. I think he knew that we, the women of this country, are fed up with the status quo. They knew that we, the women of this country, are fed up with the status quo. We want change and we want the ERA. And I believe to some extent they took the low ground uh, and will continue to fight us on the ERA, but not in public. Now that the hearing is over, we will continue to work on, work as hard as we ever have. We will build on the goodwill and the good press. We were pleased to see that ABC, that NBC associate AP was there, Fox was there, uh, federal, the federal uh, news uh, channel was there. So, um, very often we do these things and we don't get NBC, we don't get uh, Associate Press, but this time we did. Ali Patali uh, ran a story, uh, the N NBC ran a story with Ali Patali, she was there. Um, there is a solid backdrop of ERA activities that are going on behind the scenes for us at the ERA Coalition some of which you heard about this morning. We are keeping our eye on the bipartisan joint resolution one, which will remove the time limit. We expect that joint resolution one will come up for a Senate vote later, uh, probably early, not early, but next month. We are continuing our strategy of moving as a bipartisan bill, which we've been doing all along. along. We have um, not picked up any Republican senators and we've been doing this for a while and we're gonna keep at it, but we are starting to make more visits with the Democratic senators, uh, but our chief sponsors Mikowski and uh, Cardin aren't yet ready to abandon what they've referred to as our two by two strategy. Uh, that is, um, each time we bring on a co-sponsor, we bring on one from each party. At this point, we have five co-sponsors, two Republicans, two Democrats, and two um, and, and one independent, and that's in Senator Ingus King. Um, the Democrats are ready. We just have maintained this two by two strategy. The ERA coalition um, doesn't want to ignore anyone. And as I said, we are starting to meet with, re, uh, with um, Democratic senators. This week we met with, uh, we actually had a meeting with the Senator, Senator Hickenlooper from Colorado. So often it is the staffs that we meet with, but he was interested enough to meet and actually with us and actually uh, filmed a um, Instagram announcement of his support 
with Alisa Milano, which went up um, after we left this office and was up for a day or two, or however long they're up for. Uh, and th that was pretty exciting and a shot in the arm. We also visited with Senator Manchin staff and next week we have a visit with Senator um, uh, Cinema staff. So as I said, we are making the rounds to the Democrats as well, but we want you guys to continue to call on your, your senators uh, I know that you've been diligently trying to bring them into the fold. One's name continues to come up as a possibility from his colleagues in the Senate and that, well, they both have. Uh, both of your senators' names have come up. So some of the senators that we have been working with have taken it upon themselves to reach out to them so maybe between the two of us, the senators and the ERA coalition and its partners, maybe we'll get someplace, but we're not giving up hope on that. We believe that um, we've done what we've needed to do. We have 38 states ratifying and it passed Congress with two thirds vote. And that's what article five says has to happen in order for a, um, a, a a uh, amendment to to the uh, Constitution occurs. We also are keeping an eye on the uh, withdrawal of the memo that was promulgated in the pr previous uh, administration that is keeping the archivists from the United States from certifying the ERA as the 28th Amendment. So that is something that we are watching closely. Uh, the person to head that office has not yet been confirmed, but when he is confirmed, and we believe he will be confirmed, we have a petition to send to the attorney general asking that the letter, that the um, memo be withdrawn to allow the archivist to certify the, 20, the, the 28th Amendment. Uh, interestingly enough, this bill is being, um, this um, uh, memo has not been, I'm sorry, this um, confirmation has not occurred because one senator is holding it up and he's holding it up because he's um, punishing the Justice Department for not sending him uh, some information that he's requested and that would be Senator Grassley. So um, we have been a child of all sorts of, of kickback or uh, angriness uh, of different senators, um, but um, we persist. And I do believe that uh, Schroeder will be confirmed and this will come up. It can't go on forever and we know that, but um, it's going on now and we're working to get it released from the Senate. Um, the ERA, is a big tent movement. We are intersectional, we are diverse. We have sister movements, particularly the voting rights amend, the voting rights groups and the um, abortion rights. And I know that this group is very aware that voting rights, and we heard it this morning, that the ERA is a direct descendant of a, of a struggle for the vote. And thank goodness we've evolved to a place where the standard for equal access to the ballot box is regardless of sex, race, ethnicity, geography, and income. On the reproductive rights side, our sister movement, I want to take this time and the opportunity to thank NC, uh, the NC Alliance for your prompt response and a uh, statement of support to our sisters in Texas and women across the country. 
with your statement of condemnation at the passage of Senate Bill 8. Uh, you didn't waste any time. You were on it right away. So for that, we all are grateful and know that this organization, uh, NC Alliance, has its eye on the ball and is about uh, the big tent uh, movement that we say we are. At the ERA coalition, we fully understand that equality comes when the principles of reproductive justice guide our policy making and that it's re they are realized. The basic principle being that the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy belongs to us. The right to have or not have children and be able to care for our children when we do have them. We are closer than we've ever been in nearly 100 years to having an ERA. At this point, there's more high tone chit chat around the filibuster reform and our spirits are, listed, are lifted by the fact that there's so much uh, talk now about filibuster reform. When SJ1 comes up for a test vote in November, we need to have at least 52, 53 votes, more than 50, but let's just say 52, 53 in our favor. If, if filibuster reform becomes a reality and we can pass things with 50 votes or more, uh, with more than just 51 votes, um, then we can be considered for inclusion in any reconciliation package that might be moved uh, with voting rights and other hard to move legislation. So we're in it and we believe it's not over until it's over. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was, um... That was great. And we're, we're so excited watching what's happening nationally. Um, we're gonna take just two questions uh, just for time. And uh, Anne, sure. any I questions? Think, I think some of uh, Jennifer's questions were actually answered in her remarks. So I'm gonna skip some of those, but there were two around um, getting Republican women involved. You know, Since so many Republican senators, both at the federal and state level are the ones that are blocking movement. The question is, is it possible to get Republican women to launch protest about this? And at the same time, another question is, is there an effort to meet with Republican women's organizations to ultimately get them to push elected officials to support the cause? With Republican women senators, we do have two of the leading Republican women senators who are co-sponsors of the bill. Lisa Makowski and um, Susan Collins. And we have looked to them to bring along their Republican sisters. But you know, as I said early, Washington is operating a little differently. It used to be the code that uh, no permanent friends, no permanent interests, I'm sorry, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. And that doesn't seem to rule the day. I hope that uh, Collins and Mikowski will step forward and um, bring their sisters along. We have met with Ernst and uh, we are reaching out to the Senator from uh, 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 West Virginia a woman senator from West Virginia, along with uh, her counterpart, Manchin. So we're, we're doing those things. We're trying to cover those bases, but we're operating in a different space right now. Great. Thank you. I think we'll just stop it there. The rest of the questions, I believe, were covered in your remarks, and there are some comments. And again, I urge everyone to look in the chat. 
Thank you so much, Anne. And thank you again, Jennifer. We so appreciate uh, everything that you shared with us. All right. Well, this next part of the meeting is something that's really exciting for me. And I'm pleased to announce this year's Alice Paul Presidential Award. And it is going to board member Adrian Spinner for her contributions to the vision for equal rights for women. Now, she's been a board member with the ERA NC Alliance for about two years. She resides outside of Greensboro, North Carolina, where she's lived since graduating from NC a t State University. She's mainly focused on community volunteering until she ran for public office back in 2018. Now, even though she didn't win her race, she leveraged those political connections she made to continue growing in community organizing and advocacy with particular focus on fighting housing and food insecurity, advocating for public education and promoting equitable policies that uplift women and people of color. Adrian's volunteer work includes working with Equality NC and Carolina Federation, serving on the NC Council for Women, and of course, the board of directors for the ERA Alliance, and staying involved in local activism around public education and criminal justice reform. She joined the North Carolina Housing Coalition team in 2020 as a state organizing director. And she is a work at home mom of two and strongly believes in raising her children to be future activists and social justice leaders. Adrian made a video for Equal Means Equal highlighting the importance and the need for the Equal Rights Amendment for her daughter. She was a panelist in a lunch and learn with Women NC um, on social justice in North Carolina. And she spoke about the work the NC Council on Women and Youth Involvement has done around income inequality, as you can see in the photo at the uh, rally on August 26th. We're going to miss Adrian as she transitions off our board in 2022, but we know we're gonna continue hearing great things about her. Congratulations, Adrian. Would you like to say a few words? And could you spotlight Adrian for us? <laughs> there she is. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> this is <laughs> this is a surprise and an honor. Um, I yeah, I, I have no idea what to say. <laughs> I usually have to like prepare remarks because I don't like public speaking. But um, but yeah, I I have been. It's been an honor to be a part of this board. I joined this board two, two years ago, um, the years of running together these days. Um, and when I joined, I was just working at home. And so I had a lot more time than I do now. Um, so even though um, I, I hate to have to transition off the board, I am still um, a devoted member of the Alliance. And I look forward to the day that you know, we can celebrate all together and I can bring my girls and we can celebrate this 28th amendment. And I, I really believe that it's coming soon. Um, it's, it's a big part of the work that I do raising two young black women. Um, so thank you so much for um, accepting me, for, for listening to all of my ideas. And every time I start raving about the intersection of racism and, and feminism and everything. And so um, I really appreciate you accepting me into the fold and, and um, allowing me to contribute to the process. So I really appreciate you all. Uh, thank you so much, Adrian. And there will be something coming to you in the mail very soon. So thank you. Thank you again. Well, now it's time for our grand prize. So the chair is gonna recognize Anne Von Brock. Thank you, Laurie. I do not believe my daughter should have fewer rights than my sons. Thus, President Jimmy Carter clearly stated his position on the Equal Rights Amendment. President um, First Lady Rosalind Carter took up the fight to pass the ERA alongside her husband. On October 20th, 1978, President Carter signed the extension of the, Civil, of the Equal Rights Amendment ratification as a gesture to show how strongly he felt about it and how much he supported extending the ratification time limit to 1982. In addition, President Carter proclaimed um, in 1979, August 26th as Women's Equality Day. He appointed a record-breaking number of women to federal jobs. And um, he also was declared, we did not get into this fight to lose. We do not intend to lose. We will ratify the Equal Rights Amendment for the United States of America. 
Thank you, President Carter and Rosalind Carter for your support, vision, and leadership to inspire us to carry on the battle for equal rights for women. The um, North Carolina Alliance will be sending a certificate of appreciation to the Carters. And our grand prize today is a copy of Jimmy Carter, Citizen of the South, signed by the author Kay Lanning Minchu. And the book is going to be mailed to our winner number 38. And I don't know who that is. This is Denny McGuire. I'm the membership chair, and I have been tracking people as they signed in. I'm pleased to say this award goes to Rachel Hunt. All right. That's great. Congratulations, Rachel. Um, now um, I'm introduced back to Jimmy Cochran Pratt. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we are pleased to present the Susan B. Anthony Award to the League of Women Voters of North Carolina, a lead organization of the ERANC Alliance, recognized for the informed and active participation in our democracy and influence on public policy through advocacy and organizing. The LWVNC vision formed by the leaders of women's suffragist movement is a strong nonpartisan activist grassroots organization believing voters should pay a, a play a critical role in democracy. The Alliance acknowledges and thanks the League of Women Voters of North Carolina for the constant, generous, enthusiastic support of the effort to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in North Carolina. We thank you so much. Uh, the uh, League of Women Voters, uh, anytime we, we ask for anything, they say sure, and they go forward with us hand in hand. A certificate will be mailed to the League of Women Voters, North Carolina President Joe Nichols, uh, with the Alliance's sincere thanks to the entire organization. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, everyone. This is time for our 10 minute break. I wanna thank everyone for attending our general session. We will take a 10 minute break and we will be back at 1146 for our business meeting. All members will be credentialed here for voting purposes and all active members are asked to return. Uh, after the short break, guests and non-members, you may stay for our business meeting if you'd like. We'd love to have you. There's still more door prizes, so don't leave. And while you're grabbing a cup of coffee or snack, you can also send an email to Senators Burr and Tillis and view the link in the chat. If you scan that little QR code, which you can do with your phones, um, it'll show you how to go to our website where we have all of the emails of the NCGA Rules Committee, where those two bills to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in North Carolina currently languish. So thanks everyone.